Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on lessons learned during eight real-world aerial inspection scenarios. Before we begin, please be sure to mute yourself just to eliminate any background noise. Also, if you think of any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit them in the chat section on your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. So today's speakers are Christina Martinez and Colin Romberger. Christina is a dart drones flight instructor, commercial pilot, and CFII with a commercial aviation and air traffic control degree from the University of North Dakota. She has over 1,000 hours of flight time and owns a small drone business which focuses on aerial inspections and photography. Colin graduated from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University as one of the first five students to earn a master's degree in unmanned aircraft systems with a focus in flight operations and systems design. He holds multiple FAA Airman certificates for manned aircraft operations and also runs a drone services company focusing on aerial mapping and inspections. Colin is also the chief pilot and operations consultant at Dart Drones. So many of you already know that the use of drones for inspections is continuously growing across various industries. A few of these being commercial and residential real estate, construction, engineering, agriculture, oil and gas, telecom, and insurance. Drones truly are transforming the way professionals complete projects and daily operations. And that's what we really want to show you all today, how drones are being used for so many different scenarios and the lessons learned from each of those. So we have a lot of great aerial inspection scenarios to cover in today's webinar. So I will actually pass it right over to Colin and we will jump into it. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Alicia. Appreciate it. Uh, just uh, test the sound and make sure you guys can hear me just fine. Yes, thanks. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I appreciate everyone jumping on and uh, Christina, I hope uh, that we can uh, share some of our experiences with you uh, in uh, some different areas, uh, different projects that we've been involved with and, uh, you know, really uh, help uh, uh, avoid uh, you having to go through some of the same uh, learning curves and uh, fall into some of the same pitfalls uh, that we had to discover. Um, with this industry, you know, being as new as it is, uh, a lot of folks that are out there starting to integrate these aircraft, you know, we are are, you know, kind of pioneers in, in a lot of ways. And uh, Christina and I have both uh, been doing this uh, since back in the days before Part 107, uh, when uh, we were uh, operating under Section 333 exemptions. Uh, so we've, uh, you know, had some time to see some things, learn some things, and hopefully we can pass some of that uh, on to you guys today. Um, so this first uh, um, project that we were involved with was fairly interesting. Um, I have uh, thankfully only uh, ever been involved with one of these um, because it was a, a tragic situation situation. Um, the photo that you can see on the slide, uh, <clears throat> this is one image that was captured uh, while we were conducting a wide area uh, damage assessment uh, of a um, subdevelopment neighborhood uh, following a gas explosion uh, at a home. And uh, there were all of that rubble is sort of centrally located. Uh, there used to be a home there uh, in this case. And uh, uh, thankfully, uh, the people that live there had gotten out uh, before the home actually uh, exploded. Um, um, but uh, this caused uh, quite a bit of damage, um, not only obviously to the home uh, that is no longer there, but also to uh, neighboring residences. Uh, so one of the things that was necessary when the gas company came in and they were doing their investigation was to figure out, you know, just how many houses had been affected by this and uh, to be able to, you know, track uh, the scale of debris uh, going through the area. So um, we actually ended up mapping uh, the entire community uh, which had been evacuated. So from a standpoint of flight over people and things like that, uh, it was uh, you know a little bit easy to easier to coordinate than it would be otherwise in, in this type of environment. Um, but uh, just over 400 acres, and uh, you know had to uh, involved a lot of uh, work with visual observers, uh, moving folks around so that uh, as our aircraft you know covered our our territory and, and we're capturing all the images that we needed. Uh, to build uh, a, a map uh, of this area so that we could do some distance measurements and figure out where this debris spread uh, went. Um, you know, uh, it was uh, took some logistics uh, to do that. Um, so, you know, we learned actually quite a bit uh, during this flight, um, you know, one, uh, working in this type of area, um, but, uh, you know, also a couple other things that came up uh, that we wanted to, that I wanted to share. You know, one, um, one of the first things we learned was, you know, always be vigilant uh, when you're using 
using your autonomous software. Um, a lot of the software that's out there right now for autonomous flight planning, uh, especially uh, um, the, the software that's developed for photogrammetry, um, you know, constructing orthomosaics, things like that, um, it is uh, developed by third party uh, developers. Uh, so they develop the photogrammetry software to process the images, um, but the actual command and control software that's uh, working with the aircraft, you know, um, is theirs as well and, and was not necessarily developed by the manufacturer of the aircraft. Um, one of the things that caught up to us on this one uh, for the first time and, and changed the way we did things in the future was that as we were um, flying our flights, uh, this software that we were using could determine when our battery was low enough that uh, it, the aircraft needed to come back so that we could swap batteries and then uh, it would fly back and, and picked up where it left off. However, it didn't actually do that uh, uh, return process until it got down to what the aircraft system determined was the smart return to home point uh, uh, the point where it only had enough battery power left basically to to get back to our home location and uh, um, the problem with that is uh, we were actually flying into the wind uh, a little bit uh, as the aircraft was coming back and and the wind wasn't excessively strong but it was strong enough uh, and actually the aircraft was not able to make it uh, all the way back to our home point location before it had to land um, luckily where it did come down was still fairly close and uh, the area was uh, open we were able to secure it, um, go over there and, and uh, you know, swap those batteries out. Um, but uh, it, it did cost us time and, and it was something that uh, in the future when we uh, went forward, we actually started planning uh, our, our flight paths out so that uh, the aircraft was always basically upwind uh, of our takeoff landing locations. That way, whenever you do have that autonomous return, um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about fighting the wind. Um, the other thing that we uh, recognized here was, uh, you know, Anytime you've got a situation where you may attract uh, the attention of manned aircraft, um, you know, be aware of that. Um, this obviously, uh, there was a lot of media attention around this situation, and uh, you know, we coordinated with uh, the gas company. We had every you know right to be there. We were following all the regulations, um, but we did still have occasion uh, where we had a couple uh, helicopters uh, that uh, um, one that was from the local news outlet, one that was just uh, we figure on a, a bit of a sightseeing trip. And helicopters, you know, they can they can fly low, uh, and and they often fly low. Um, when you look at the Federal Aviation Regulations, you know, in a lot of situations, manned aircraft will be staying 500 feet above the ground or more. But actually, in actuality, when you're in uncontrolled airspace, you know, they can basically be as low as they need uh, in a situation that they can still execute a safe landing. That's that's pretty much what the regulations say. So helicopters, you know, they like to check things out. Um, what we ended up doing in this situation was we uh, made a phone call uh, to uh, the air traffic control tower uh, at a nearby airport because we were just outside of their controlled airspace and uh, they were able to radio uh, to the aircraft uh, that were in the area and uh, let them know what was going on uh, so we didn't have to keep interrupting uh, our flight or pausing our autonomous flight uh, as uh, to avoid you know any any conflicts with them um, so next uh, next uh, scenario there Phil you don't mind Alicia we'll move on because I, I know Christine has got a lot to talk about as well um, some of the other work uh, that we do um, involves uh, bridge inspections uh, and unfortunately I don't have any inspection photos to show you from this one where we're looking at any sort of elements um, mainly because because with our company, uh, we have contracts in place with our clients, and our clients are basically long-term uh, uh, clients. We don't do a whole lot of one-off projects per se, um, and basically they have the rights uh, to all of our imagery uh, once we capture them. So this is one uh, that just shows you an overview of an area where we did uh, a little bit of bridge inspection work uh, for a railroad company. Uh, these were, um, you know, uh, rail tracks that are used by railway, and uh, we went in and uh, did some uh, investigation of critical components uh, around some of those pylons uh, and also just uh, some areas uh, with uh, the, the steel structures uh, involved uh, in those tracks. Um, some of the things uh, that uh, you know we we learned with this uh, uh, in in just you know doing this bridge work and uh, we do this um, you know not only for the railway bridges but also roadway bridges uh, which we'll see in one of our other scenarios. Um, but whenever you're operating in these environments and and something that I know Christina's had experience with as well, uh, you know you always have to be aware, uh, that especially if you're going to be underneath uh, those uh, bridges, that uh, your GPS signals um, are going to be very weak uh, or 
or unavailable altogether. Um, we've get, actually gotten into the habit uh, when we are doing inspections that involve work underneath uh, the bridges themselves, if we're looking at different components from that perspective, um, we will not fly uh, with uh, the GPS enabled. Um, in some situations, uh, I know some users uh, are using a um, real-time kinematic or an RTK system where the aircraft can get its positioning information from a base station uh, so that it can still have the benefit uh, of that enhanced positioning. Um, other systems are being developed with proximity sensors uh, so that they can detect how close the aircraft is uh, to the different uh, facades and things uh, or the different um, you know structures themselves and use that uh, to kind of triangulate their position and, and stay where they need to be. Um, both of which are great solutions for this, um, but really, you know, if you don't have those uh, scenarios, you really don't want to, uh, in my experience anyway, leave the GPS uh, system on uh, whenever you're in those types of environments if you know uh, that uh, the potential for low signal or loss of signal is going to be there. Um, because what can sometimes happen is as that signal starts to degrade, the aircraft can start doing some erratic stuff uh, before the, uh, the, the, the flight computer uh, itself will finally say, okay, you know, I'm going to kick out of here and, and switch you over just to uh, the manual flight mode and the you know attitude mode or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something to definitely be aware of. And, you know, I highly recommend, you know, not doing that work unless you're using a system that will give you, you know, some other type of enhanced stability uh, using some other types of sensors uh, or, or that RTK system. Um, other things you have to watch out for, you know, interference issues, um, you know, depending on uh, what type of, uh, you know, infrastructure is running through that bridge as well. Uh, you know, you may have issues with uh, you know, electromagnetic fields. Um, you may have issues uh, with things that can, you know, cause an impact on the aircraft stability uh, in other ways as well. Um, I will talk more about electromagnetic fields in one of our other examples, but, you know, just know that uh, those things are also uh, present. Um, you know, whenever you're, you're uh, doing the work underneath uh, the structures, again, overhead environments, uh, you know, um, a lot of times uh, we don't, uh, when we're flying in open air, you know, we don't uh, think about, uh, you know, the, the effects of those overhead uh, uh, structures and things. Um, and, you know, by default, a lot of our systems are set up uh, so that uh, if we do have issues, um, the, the automatic default is going to be a return to home uh, type of scenario. Uh, anytime you're doing work uh, like this, where you have uh, these overhead obstructions, you've got to put it in your checklist and you have to remember to change that. Um, because if you are, in, uh, if for whatever reason, connected to a, a GPS satellite positioning signal as well still, and you have that uh, data link loss, you know, if the aircraft tries to go up and you don't have any uh, sensors up there to prevent it, uh, then, you know, that's going to be a big, uh, big challenge. Um, also, lighting conditions, you know, when we're flying under these structures or we're flying around the structures, trying to get proper angles uh, to be able to properly capture and visualize different critical components, uh, you know, shadows, uh, you know, changing effects of cloud cover moving in the area throughout the day, um, that plays you know, a big role in the quality of, of the data uh, that we're collecting. And if the images that we're capturing can't clearly show the detail, you know, then then we're going to be out of luck. Um, so another another lesson learned in, in doing some of that work over time. Uh, road assessments. Um, so right now, uh, this is probably the majority of the work uh, that uh, my company does is uh, roadway uh, assessments. And uh, we do these for a variety of purposes, uh, you know, new construction development, um, widening projects, uh, you know, traffic pattern modifications, uh, interchange uh, uh, modifications, things like that. Uh, we actually have been doing a lot of work with pothole <laughs> identification here recently. And, uh, you know, depending on the need uh, of the client that we're working with uh, on these, you know, they can vary uh, in terms of what type uh, of images we're capturing and, and what type of flight paths we need to fly uh, to get uh, all of our, our different uh, coverage areas. Um, so some of our, our lessons learned, uh, depending on the nature of the project, you know, one, we always have to be able to really put the time in in pre-flight planning uh, whenever we do this type of work. Um, we know that our Part 107 regulations tell us that we cannot fly over moving vehicles uh, on a roadway, and this is not something that we have an exemption for. 
at this point. We we do this work and we still abide by uh, those regulations. So uh, especially if we're trying to do some sort of an ortho mosaic uh, assessment uh, or an ortho mosaic project where we're collecting images and then using photogrammetry software to again build maps and things uh, that uh, the the clients can use for planning purposes and and things like that. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, how we plan out our flight legs uh, and uh, make sure that we're flying, you know, down medians, uh, we're flying up, uh, you know, center uh, dividers um, and off on the shoulders. We are not uh, actually ever flying over the moving vehicles. Uh, and when it comes time to cross those lanes of traffic, you know, we can't let the aut autonomous software just do this for us. We have to, you know, pause that um, and then take manual control uh, often when we do those crossing runs uh, so that we can use the, the camera system, look for a gap in the traffic and, and still be able to uh, to get where we need to be. So having that extra challenge of, you know, cars on the, the roadway, uh, you know, workers in certain areas uh, that may not be involved with our project uh, and still being able to, you know, figure out how you're going to maneuver that aircraft uh, to get all of the shots that you need. That's something that you need to determine before the aircraft ever goes in the sky. Uh, and you really need to take the time to develop those flight profiles um, before uh, you, you, you uh, start the operation. Um, also, you know, the using visual observers uh, to extend our operating range. Um, very important here, uh, you know, if we were to stick uh, just with our line of sight requirements as a single operator, you know, at most, uh, I would say, you know, my, my eyes, you know, I'm, I'm 36 years old, my eyesight's pretty good, um, but, uh, you know, I would say I'm not going to be able to see, you know, more than probably about a half mile or so, uh, given the size of uh, most of our systems in either direction. So if we were only doing, you know, one mile at a time and some of our projects, you know, are 10, 20 miles that they want us to potentially cover in a day, um, you know, that wouldn't work out very well. Uh, so we've developed a system of being able to use visual observers uh, to basically, you know, chain together uh, and keep uh, communication uh, using radios uh, back to myself or one of our other pilots so that we can cover uh, larger stretches at a time. Um, you know, typically, you know, maybe about three miles or so at a time uh, as opposed to just a single mile. So, um, you know, all things uh, that uh, that we've learned uh, as part of that. Um, one of the other things that we learned uh, when we're using visual observers to extend range is, uh, you know, also make sure that they're familiar with, uh, you know, how to watch out the dangers involved with certain birds. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, you know, birds of prey, especially during certain times of year, uh, you know, your hawks, eagles, things like that. If they have young in their nests and you're flying around those nesting areas, uh, they can be aggressive. Uh, and they, you know, don't want you there. Uh, and, and those are situations where you can have uh, a bird attack. Um, so we also, in our pre-flight assessments, whenever we learn about these locations, one of the things we try and do is determine uh, if there are would be uh, nesting areas uh, along these stretches of highway that we need to cover. Um, that way, whenever we, you know, we identify those, those are usually the areas where I myself will stand so that I can have a better view uh, of, you know, whether or not those birds are taking an interest. Because uh, when the aircraft's out of my visual line of sight uh, and it's only another visual observer that's watching it, very hard to avoid that type of situation. Um, next uh, uh, scenario or, or last scenario I believe I've got. Um, so uh, utilities uh, infrastructure. Um, this is something that uh, we didn't do a lot of. Uh, we were involved with this uh, for about a three month period, uh, maybe about a year or so ago. And uh, we were actually working with a client uh, who um, was starting up their own unmanned aircraft uh, uh, division. And uh, they did uh, power line inspections uh, for uh, a large power company in Pennsylvania. And um, uh, one of the things that they wanted us uh, to help them with was basically a proof of concept of, of using an unmanned aircraft system to do some of the work uh, that they were tasked with doing. Um, some of the things that, uh, the, one of the biggest things that they uh, were asked to do was basically get uh, photographic uh, uh, images to show condition of insulators and also what they call retaining keys uh, that uh, basically are, are kind of like 
like uh, almost act like cotter pins uh, that kind of holds uh, these lines uh, to uh, their their insulators and uh, different uh, attachment points on the structures. So um, the problem is that when they put these keys in, uh, sometimes they don't put them in in the right direction. And uh, when the winds and things kick up, uh, they can easily fall free. Uh, and that creates a situation where you could, you know, end up with a, a structural um, you know, problem down the line. So, uh, you know, one of the biggest things uh, that we had to learn with this, and, and Alicia, you can go ahead and move over to the next slide uh, on this one. Um, you know, one, the importance of establishing a repetitive flight profile. So, you know, when we were looking at not so much the insulators, you know, they're fairly uh, easily accessible, fairly easily viewed uh, when we when we put the aircraft up. Um, but as far as those little keys go, you know, depending based on their size and, and kind of where they're mounted, which side of the structures they're mounted on, um, they can be difficult uh, to, to get a good image of, uh, even when we're flying an unmanned aircraft, you know, fairly close up. So, you know, being able to, you know, have a test location, if you will, or spend the time to, you know, go to uh, that location and, uh, you know, figure out how you need to maneuver the aircraft uh, around each structure uh, to be able to just go right to the locations where you need uh, those images captured and then sort of move on from there. Um, that's going to save you a lot of time when you get in the field. Uh, you really don't want to figure that out uh, the first time you go out on some sort of operational flight um, because it's it's really going to make things complicated it's going to put more workload on your end and uh, you know just ultimately uh, be somewhat of a problem um, so you know make sure that you can you know figure that out ahead of time uh, and, and that way you know it becomes basically a systematic approach uh, as you go from one structure to another um, also you know especially with uh, transmission power lines uh, these uh, these types of structures we were working around um, and also depending on uh, sort of the structures uh, that they use for these uh, these lines as well. Um, the presence of extremely low frequency or ELF uh, electromagnetic fields uh, is very, very strong. And, you know, there's different people out there that will tell you, you know, well, if you use this type of aircraft, you know, it's not going to affect you, things like that, or this manufacturer, you know, their aircraft won't be affected. They haven't, you know, seen issues. And I don't doubt that, you know, folks haven't seen issues. Um, but I can tell you from firsthand experience uh, that if you put yourself uh, in the wrong position, uh, around those structures and you know sometimes you need to go in those positions to get the shots of the components that you've been assigned to do um, your magnetometer uh, on that aircraft will be affected uh, if you are not if, if that is involved in uh, your position and navigation um, configuration so uh, what we found is when we were doing this work you know we would not do it uh, unless we had an RTK ground station uh, set up with the aircraft because even with a, a, a model uh, that was an, an enterprise level aircraft, triple redundant uh, compass modules, GPS receivers and IMUs, uh, it was still impacted if you left it in the wrong area for more than about, you know, a minute or so. Um, you know, all three of those magnetometers uh, were, were affected and, and dropped offline. So, you know, if you're going to do this type of work, um, recognize that that is uh, something that you have to be aware of. And, you know, when that starts going, going wrong, you know, when that magnetometer starts being affected, um, you're in for a wild ride and it's basically like trying to you know fight uh, a swordfish you know on the line uh, to get that aircraft uh, to a safe area uh, where the the interference is no longer a factor and you can recover it um, also kind of leading from that uh, you know when you are doing this type of work in these you know more hazardous type of flight environments um, you know having a, a payload that will allow for optical zoom um, you know with a with a good optical camera uh, or an optical zoom camera I should say um, really very valuable um, because it does allow us to enhance our standoff distances, um, but still be able to get up close and uh, get uh, very detailed photos um, of uh, our areas of interest without just simply enlarging the pixels uh, that we like we would do with a, a digital zoom uh, type of configuration. Um, so, you know, if you are doing that type of work, having that uh, that optical zoom capability is really going to come in handy. So I think that uh, pretty much does it for me. Uh, so I'll go ahead and we'll pass it back to Alicia and Christina. Great. Thanks, Colin. And Christina, we will pass it over to you. Excellent. So I've got a couple other inspection scenarios I'd like to talk about. Um, and the first is home inspections. So I started my drone company in the real estate industry because um, that's what I knew and that's where my contacts were. And that kind of led into home inspections. So every time a house or a townhome or a condo or anything is sold, 
um, there are often home inspections that go along with it. Because um, that's part of the purchase process, you typically only have a couple of days to get that home inspected and the client to either accept or reject the offer. Um, so they usually have a short turnaround time. So we might, we might get 12 to 36 hours at the most, usually 24 hours for us to get these jobs done. So the quick jobs, um, they can come really frequently in the summer, which is awesome. And we can fit them in throughout the day. It's nice because um, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, if, whether it's sunny or cloudy, we're just getting good pictures of the roofing. Um, so here's an example of a home that obviously has some damage to it. Um, this is actually, uh, unfortunately, it was new construction and uh, a windstorm came through and there was a bunch of houses in the neighborhood that had roofing um, damage to them. So we're usually hired by the home inspector because they can't reach some part of the roof. Um, maybe there's low hanging trees, um, maybe there's uh, roofing materials that they can't walk on, let's say like solar panels, clay tiles, things like that, um, or perhaps the height of the building. A lot of inspectors don't like to go above two stories, which is not surprising because that's a long way down if something wants to happen. Um, or in a lot of um, multiple unit uh, townhomes, things like that, um, there is no access to the roof. So we get called out for those ones. So let's talk about the types of images that we need to capture for the, um, for the home inspector. Uh, we always do just an overhead shot that shows the entire area. Um, in the top left there, um, notice um, that's a little Mavic shadow. Um, we love to fly the Mavic, even the Mavic Air for our roof inspections. I'll talk about why in just a minute. Um, on the top right, that's an example of clay tiles. Um, the type of roofing will depend on the area that you live in. So I'm in the upper Midwest, so we might see shakes, we will see asphalt shingles, we see some clay tiles, we see a few um, solar panels here and there, but not maybe as much as down south. Um, so you'll want to see, um, that will kind of determine what types of roofs you're inspecting. The one on the bottom left, um, you'll see there's a cracked shingle um, or a missing asphalt shingle there on the, on the kind of the bottom left of that, that picture. Um, you're looking for things like that. So anything that sticks out, um, we get extra pictures. Um, you can't tell in this picture, but I'm actually underneath low hanging trees where an inspector would not have been able to walk. So this was a two story um, townhome that I was on top of. And then on the bottom right, um, that picture is also a, a, a townhome or a duplex. Um, and not only do we inspect the roofs, but all um, sides of the house as well. So this one has an overhang. You can see a gutter um, just to the right of that window. And then there's a lot of um, detail around those windows, those pop-out windows that we'll be inspecting as well. So the types of inspection, the imagery that you capture is really going to depend on the layout of the home, um, the area that you live in, and what the inspector can and can't reach. So we always do edge detail shots. We always do an overhead shot. Um, we'll take pictures of any vents or fans or gutters that are there. Um, just anything that we think that inspector might want to see. The more images, we don't want to overwhelm them with too much, but we want to make sure we capture everything. Um, one thing that we do that I think is key for our company is we always include what I call the beauty shot or the real estate shot. And what that is is just that nice framed picture of the front of the home that the home inspector can use for the front of their inspection booklet. Um, and they absolutely love that. It's that extra little piece of service that we can add on um, that doesn't cost us anything, just an extra minute or two in the air. And the home inspector really appreciates it. So on the next slide, um, let's talk about some lessons learned. So um, it's really important to understand exposure control. So we'll do these anywhere from seven in the morning as soon as the sun comes up to late in the afternoon. Our, our real estate clients, we'd like to keep around the noon hour to eliminate those shadows. Um, so we'll do these kind of in the, the end, the beginning and the end of each day. Um, so understanding the exposure control is important because you get a lot of shadows on the either end of the days. So we really like to make sure that we are exposing correctly so that we can actually see the detail in the shingles, see the detail in the gutters and make sure we, we can identify any damage. Um, we are flying extremely close to the houses. So we're maybe five feet away oftentimes um, and we're underneath the tree cover, we're um, flying up next to chimneys. So high wind situations can be a little bit nerve wracking. Um, and that's one reason that we love to use smaller drones for our residential inspections. Um, because we're so close to the homes, it's easier to fit the drone into different locations, maybe in the peaks and valleys of the roof. Um, or if we have neighbors nearby, um, I absolutely love my Inspire, but that thing's a little noisy and it's a little bit intimidating if you're right next door to another residential house. So that's why I love to use the Mavic Pro, Mavic Air, um, even the Phantom 4. 
for those situations. Okay, so on the next slide, let's talk about chimney inspections. So um, when we started doing home inspections, that kind of led to chimney inspections. Um, a lot of houses in my area in like the 1920s to 1950s or 60s time frame have these old brick chimneys. And this is something that we can inspect year round because um, they don't really gather snow on them too much. And um, because they're common in older neighborhoods, they're generally a little bit older chimneys or they're going to look for wear and tear that they can't easily see from the ground. So they'll call on us drone pilots. Um, and again, they are usually home inspection related. Um, and we'll go up there and we'll capture images all around the chimney. And some things we're looking for, um, we're looking for the flashing to make sure that there's no damage there, no rust, no issue, um, nothing's peeling or bent. Um, we look at damage to the bricks, um, whether we've seen some that are crumbling. This one is actually in pretty good um, condition here. Um, you can see there's actually snow on the roof as well. Um, but we look for crumbling in the masonry um, and it helps them identify if they absolutely have to get an inspector up there. So sometimes these will give them the preliminary information. They'll say, yep, this one looks great, no problem. Sometimes we'll um, send them the pictures and be like, oh, we got to get an inspector up there. It looks like there might be um, further damage we want to document for that homeowner. Let's go to the next slide here and we'll see some other pictures of chimneys. Um, so you'll notice that we have to get all the way around to the four sides. If you look at the picture on the top left, you can see a big tree there, and that's pretty common. Because these are older homes, you have those really mature trees, and those trees are generally pretty close to the houses. Um, so that means to get all four sides of the house, you're really flying in close proximity um, to other trees, to that building, um, and so you need to really have um, your drone skills down. Um, it's important that you don't hit anything. Um, and then, as Colin mentioned before, there's also um, birds. So this is uh, baby season for the birds. We have a lot of nesting going on. Um, and that means that when you are in those areas close to the trees, you also need to watch out for the birds because you are pretty close to them as well. So in order to get all four sides of that chimney, um, you need to be able to manage your exposure um, just like the regular roof inspections, because if the sun is at some angle, the other side of that chimney is going to be dark. So make sure that you understand how to manually expose your camera. Um, either to change the shutter speed or um, any combination of things in order to make sure that you can actually see the detail even on the dark side or that you don't overexpose the light side of that, that chimney. So we also want to get the top down look um, for the chimney cap and your job is really to document the entire chimney. So some of our lessons learned, um, the first thing is that exposure control to get good images all the way around. Um, that's going to be the difference between kind of an amateur um, pilot who's flying on auto, uh, auto mode, um, to auto exposure to someone who is providing really good imagery and um, also getting paid a little bit better for uh, their products that they have. So it can be difficult to maintain line of sight when moving around the chimney. You have to fly on all four sides, which means um, two or maybe even three sides might be places where you might not easily be able to see the drone. Um, and that's where a visual observer can help. So um, having someone on the other side of the building or other side of the house um, can help. And then we will usually have radios or something like that so we can see them. You'll notice when you do a lot of roof inspections, you are flying over your head, which makes it a little bit harder to hear if you have a visual observer on the ground. So making sure that you can actually hear each other is important. So you're flying very close to the chimneys. Um, we know that um, collision avoidance, obstacle avoidance is awesome on our new drones, Phantom 4 Pros and Mavics. Um, however, you don't want that to be going, the, the um, alarms to be going off constantly. So you might have to turn some of that off so that you can get close enough. Um, I've had cases where flying underneath the trees, if I don't turn the obstacle avoidance off, it won't let me get close enough. So you do have to fly with those safety features off sometimes, which means you need to be a very good pilot in order to get in those close areas. Um, make sure you get the top down views as well. Sometimes people forget those. Um, you want to make sure you get the chimney cap and um, that view. Um, that's an area where an inspector often can't access because it's too tall for them. So um, make sure you get all angles and all views of those chimneys. As you mentioned before, the smaller drones often work better because they can fit in the valleys of the roofs um, and also to the proximity of the neighbors. And these older homes are usually closer together um, and you really don't want um, to garner that attention of flying a large drone in the area. So we love the Mavics and the Phantom Forest for that purpose. Um, so the commercial inspections for churches, um, we've actually got quite a number of churches, which is interesting. I hadn't even thought of this as an area um, 
for drones until I started getting calls for them. So churches often have older roofs. Um, some of them are very steep, um, and a lot of them will have things like slate or a tile on them um, that you can't walk on. So maybe they're not super high or they're not super steep, but they have these old slate tiles from the 1940s, 1950s, and the inspectors can't walk on them. So we'll usually get these for insurance claims. Um, it's usually wind damage or excessive tail damage, things like that, um, and we'll get called out to do them. The steeples are um, usually wind or hail damage as well. And interestingly enough, in some locations, you have to have permits to climb steeples um, or a lot of insurance, which makes it prohibitive for an inspector to get up there for just, um, just to kind of look around to see if an insurance claim should be made. So uh, we get a lot of calls on church steeples and those are, um, they can be easy, they can be difficult. Some of them are like, I, I guess, see-through steeples that you can see all the way through. Um, some of them are like this, where it's um, a steeple on top of a, a large um, area that you have to fly all the way around. Um, sometimes, and they're usually on the ends of the building, which is kind of helpful for being able to see them. But so they're so tall that you might have to do a couple of different heights in order to capture all of the imagery. So um, that's kind of become an interesting part of our business as we fly at churches a lot, which is kind of neat. So on the next slide here, um, this is another view of that church. This is the roof. So this was a, an older building. As you can see, there's a lot of um, moss and stuff growing on the top of it. But you can see easily see things like patches. Um, you can see the valleys. Um, you can see anywhere in other locations there were vents set here, and we could look around the vents to make sure that there was no excessive rust going on. And as a drone pilot, it's not my job to, to look at this roof and say, oh, yep, this is definitely an insurance claim, or um, yeah, this is going to be, you know, this kind of damage. My job is to document the images and identify areas that we might need additional pictures on and then provide that to the inspector. So like on the ridge, I can see that there's um, some replaced tiles up there. I can see that patch and then <clears throat> there's something on the top left there that's sticking up and might be like maybe a missing tile or something. So I would then go in and in addition to my ortho mosaic to get some closer uh, views of those areas. So some lessons learned from churches. Um, the way that we do them, um, we generally end up with the inspector on site. Um, and either that's a representative um, from the church who is putting in the um, insurance claim, or it's the insurance adjuster that's there that wants to see the documentation. Because of that, um, we always bring a visual observer. With these ones, I love to fly the Inspire. Um, I'm not quite as, there's not as many peaks and valleys as there are in a residential house. Um, and usually there's a little bit more space around them. So having the Inspire works out great. Um, I can usually have my visual observer hold the second remote and then show the inspector what I'm doing. And they absolutely love it. Um, it gives them kind of a real time view and they can go, oh, wait, wait, back up. Let me see what that is. And they might be be able to identify things that maybe I don't know about because I'm a drone pilot. That's my expertise. Their expertise is the adjustments and insurance claims. Um, so they absolutely love it because they know they get the exact data that they want. Um, oftentimes, the inspectors also have a lot of questions about drones. So having that additional visual observer um, can be really helpful for someone just to talk to. Um, you kind of create a little bit of, bit of a rapport with the inspector. And we have actually gotten calls um, from the inspectors who then go out to other jobs and then want us to come and help them out, which is um, really nice. Something to remember, when I do my home inspections, um, I just dress normal business casual as a drone pilot. Um, when I do my um, church inspections or more commercial inspections, I make sure that I am wearing that reflective vest all the time. Um, I love carrying a clipboard. No one looks more professional than someone with a clipboard, right? Because you, you're meant to be there. You've got a checklist. Um, I'm, I have a, a manned aircraft pilot background, so the checklists to me are, are super awesome. Um, but we always carry that clipboard with us. And on that clipboard, we have any um, waivers or authorizations that we need for the area. And then we also have the request from the person who hired us. Um, we have shown up on sites before and they're like, who are you? What are you doing? Wait, who called you? Because the person working the front desk at the church is probably not the person who's involved in the insurance claim. Um, the insurance adjuster that shows up is probably not, they're usually subcontractors to the insurance company. So they might not know that you're showing up. So I always have the name and phone number of the person who hired me for the job um, in case any clarification needs to happen. Okay, so let's talk about construction next. So um, we somehow ended up in uh, kind of the apartment building construction area. We do a lot of apartment buildings as they're being built. 
I love them because they're like 24 month contracts and we're out there every month. It's reg regularly scheduled income, which is awesome. Um, and because we're uh, shooting those, um, those pictures during the construction phase, we will often get called out post construction if there's any warranty questions. So this here is an example of a townhome. Um, uh, I think there's a couple, maybe four or five units in this one. And interestingly enough, this is actually um, just outside, I call it like the inner ring, but where you're not allowed to fly in class D airspace, we're just outside of that. So we could only go up to 100 feet here. Um, the awesome thing is flying inspections. You're generally only five to 10 feet above the building. So that wasn't an issue. Um, but it is important to know how to get those authorizations to fly in airspace. We do a lot of work at airspace. So I'm um, using drones for warranties allows for precise and detailed data. And common things that we're called for are um, siding concerns. Um, there have been, unfortunately, buildings where the siding is coming off or popping off or, you know, the slightest windstorm blows it off. Um, roofing is very common. You saw the, um, the house in the beginning where the, roof, the um, shingles were, were peeling back. Um, that was an entire neighborhood that had that issue. Water damage, they might be getting water damage around the windows, around the balconies, um, around vents, or, or where siding meets brick or something like that. And then windows in general, we get a lot of window um, construction warranty requests. So let's take a look here. Um, on top is, um, we have one, one apartment building construction company that we do quite a bit for. And this was one of their post-construction warranty requests. It's about a 150 unit building. And um, unfortunately, the siding was not installed correctly on the entire building. And so what they needed was a sampling of data to bring back to the company who did the siding and show them that, hey, look, this was done incorrectly. It needs to be redone. And there's actually right now a lawsuit right now, and our pictures are being used in the lawsuit for this building. And so we get on site, and we, we always make sure in a job this big that we are going to meet with the person who is in charge of um, the insurance claim so that we get them the, the correct imagery. Because if we show up here for three hours on site and get a bunch of pictures, we want to make sure we're getting the correct pictures. So for example, he wanted pictures um, of where the brick met the siding on here. Um, underneath the window in the bottom left, there's a ledge that sticks out and they were getting water in there. Um, in the bottom center, um, there was no flashing installed between the roofing and the siding underneath all the eaves across the entire apartment building. Um, so he wanted, what he wanted then was samples of each of those. So there's 150 units or so. He said, okay, get me 10 windows, get me um, eight balconies and whatever. So we created, and I'll talk about this actually in a minute, but let me show you the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right is the last image there. Notice that image looks blown out, like it's overexposed, um, but that's on purpose. When I talk about using um, a manual exposure to expose for the correct thing, um, that's what we're doing here. So what I was trying to show, and it worked out really well, um, was the area where the flat roof met um, the side of the building that came up to expose for that. So the roof itself was blown out, but I can perfectly see where the top of that roof meets the side of the building. So let's go to the next slide here and I'll kind of walk through what we did for the inspector. So um, he wanted a sampling of the windows, of the balconies, um, things like that. So what we did is we had a schematic, just a really rough schematic of the entire apartment building. And we would take kind of a far back shot of the area we were going to inspect so that he knew approximately where on the apartment building it was. And then on the schematic we had drawn, we would label like one, two, three, four, like W1, W2, W3 for the windows. And then when we submitted the images to him, he would be able to see that the image named W1 matched on the schematic of W1. So that if he saw damage on that window, he could then pinpoint exactly where on the building that was. Um, it made it incredibly helpful for him, saved him a lot of time, and he was so pleased. He's like, unfortunately, if this ever happens again, I hope it doesn't, um, but you guys will be the first to call because your data was so easy to use and to present to the client. Um, very, very helpful for, for them. So um, one thing to keep in mind with these apartment buildings, the day that we shot that building or took pictures of it, it was the nicest day of like the fall. Um, and there were tons of people outside. There was a huge park across the street. There were pedestrians everywhere. There were people sitting on the balconies, like of half of the, the apartment buildings. And the complex had not told anybody that there would be drone pilots on, on the site. Um, so luckily I had two visual observers and they basically, one of them acted as a VO. 
and the other one kind of acted as PR. So anytime that we flew near someone on a balcony, they would smile and wave and say, hey, we're just doing some inspections of the siding, we'll be gone in a minute. Um, and I had brought, I usually bring at least two drones on site just in case something happened. Um, and, and one, maybe the batteries don't work or I don't know. I always bring, I always bring a backup. Um, so I had brought the Inspire because that's kind of the easiest, right? If I have my um, inspector on set so they can see what I'm looking at. And I had brought my Phantom 4 Pro. And I pull the Inspire out and the, the inspector's like, yeah, so we need to get like in the balconies and then turn around and then face this part where they have drainage. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I cannot be flying my Inspire in people's balconies when they don't even know that I'm on site. So <laughs> we put the Inspire back in the case and then took the Phantom 4 out, and it's a much smaller and even a more stable drone, and that was the best drone to fly for that situation. So definitely, um, it's, it's really helpful to have those smaller drones sometimes, um, but it's also nice to have the larger ones. So it kind of depends on what your, um, kind of what your client base is and what your, your um, products are that you deliver, but it's nice to have those options. Okay, so on the next slide here, um, so I live in Minnesota, and we had the Super Bowl this year. Um, so it was awesome. It was freezing cold, uh, like absolutely freezing cold. It got down to like minus eight in the mornings a couple of days Fahrenheit. Um, but we had the opportunity to do a lot of flying for the Super Bowl, which was really, really neat. This is the first year that they had like a lot of drones up in the air. Um, they were everywhere, but they actually shut down the entire city to drones two weeks in advance. And so it was kind of neat. We learned about all the permitting process. We, we were the, the first drone company to get permits to fly in the Minneapolis area um, during this shutdown process. And then we had two different jobs that we did. Um, the first one was um, for a company that we were just doing some mapping of the area because they put up so many temporary structures. Um, they didn't quite know like, okay, well, wh where are all these structures? How did it change from emergency response, et cetera? So we did a lot of ortho mosaic flying for that. And then after that, we ended up getting hired by a subcontractors to another drone company um, where we had drones in the air for anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day at locations around the city for five, four days straight. Um, and my company is, is not that big. We use a lot of we use contractors occasionally. There's a couple of us that fly regularly, um, but I needed other drone pilots. And I would really advise you if you are whatever industry that you're in with drones or whatever area you're in to network with other pilots um, and you'll find that you are able to refer jobs and they're able to refer jobs back to you so we don't have a scarcity mentality um, we share work whenever we can we work with each other we help each other there's a lot of um, facebook pages and stuff out there we're all part of and so this company called and they're like can you staff it and we were able to immediately say yes we can staff this project it was a lot of money it was awesome um, and we were able to easily staff it because we knew other good drone pilots in the area and we were friendly with them. So we had, besides the people in our company, we had hired five other drone pilots. We flew from anywhere from 8 a.m. until midnight, um, four days in a row. And it was an amazing experience to work as a team with that many people. So we were actually live streaming the entire day. Um, all four days and we had to have as one drone landed the other drone had to get up in the air to finish the live stream So we were continuously live streaming for 12 to 16 hours a day every single day um, One of the important things that we learned in this uh, Process was how to say no to a client So unfortunately it was snowing for at least one of the days and they're like come on you guys got to get up and we're like You know what we it's below three miles visibility. We cannot fly it's a 107 requirement and we actually got a call from the FAA like an hour later like hey are you, are you guys in the air we see a drone and we're like nope that's not us and the FAA went and found that person because they were it was maybe a half mile of visibility and they were flying a drone in the area so definitely learn um, and and make sure your clients know the expectations of when you can and can't fly um, our no fly for temperature was minus six <laughs> so it was a little bit chilly um, but it was minus eight one morning. So they had to wait until like 10 o'clock in the morning for us to fly that morning. So it was an awesome experience. Um, I loved working with a, a big team like that. Um, it was, we're really kind of breaking the ground. Um, all of us drone pilots, me, Colin, all of you, um, because this is all new technology. So every year, every month, every week, every day, something new is happening with drones. And, and it's because we're flying safe, we're flying responsibly, and we're working together as a, as a team, even if it's nationwide people. So. Very neat experience. 
Okay, one more thing I want to talk about, um, and that is our aerial, aerial roof inspections workshop. So we teach these workshops around the country, and they go through a lot of the knowledge that you'll need to know for things that Colin and I just talked about. So for example, um, on day one, we do a lot of um, roofing 101, um, how to do aerial roof inspections. We basically teach you the lingo to use, um, the things to look for, so that when an inspector calls you and they say, hey, go inspect the dormer, you don't go, what's a dormer? Um, so we teach you um, all that information so that you can go talk intelligently to your client. Um, we also teach you how to capture quality imagery, um, how to get off of, off of auto exposure and onto manual so that you can get those best exposed images. And then we even do um, things like mapping and modeling. So how to um, do uh, ortho mosaics for the best resolution for pictures. So we'll do an ortho mosaic and you can actually pick out like nail heads and um, the roofing materials or um, you can identify whether something is bird poop, if it's a white, a white speck, whether it's bird poop or moss or um, mildew or a paper bag that's stuck up there. So um, the imagery is amazing. And then we even do some thermal imaging as well. So um, these workshops are taught all around the country. And then the information that you learn from those, you can actually bring into any type of inspection, whether it's utilities or roofing or the commercial warranty work that we do. So I'd highly encourage you to take a look on the Dart Drones website um, and see if there is a location near you. Thank you so much, Christina. And before we get into our Q&A session, I did want to quickly mention um, our 2018 workshop schedule. So this year we will be in Denver, Chicago, Houston, New York Metro, Las Vegas, Ashburn, Atlanta, and Dallas. And we will only be in each of these cities once this year. So definitely take advantage of these dates. Um, I will also be sending out an email with uh, some information later on today. So I'll be sure to include all of these dates for you guys. All right, so we did get um, a few questions. So we'll start going through a few of those. Um, Colin, when you were going through your section, someone asked, um, which type of drone do you use for these types of inspections? Well, it, it depends on uh, which ones we were talking about. Um, when it's uh, something that involves uh, uh, generating ortho mosaics, uh, so you know, using uh, photogrammetry software, um, you know, typically we use uh, the Phantom 4 Pro um, simply because it's got uh, the 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 best camera sensor, basically, uh, with uh, the 20 megapixel one inch sensor, uh, mechanical shutter, um, all things that uh, that photogrammetry software uh, you know really likes whenever it's uh, building the products. Um, so. So, so that's fairly common with us um, whenever we're doing some of the more <clears throat> Uh, when we were doing the uh, power line work, uh, that was actually with a uh, M600, uh, DJI M600 with a uh, RTK solution uh, from DJI, uh, basically just to provide the security uh, from the uh, the magnetometer interference, uh, no um, additional positioning accuracy from a, a mapping or, or modeling accuracy standpoint. Um, but And then beyond that, uh, like Christina, we also have an Inspire, uh, and we have done some long-range uh, projects. Uh, larger mapping projects uh, with fixed wing aircraft as well, but we don't usually do that for the roadway projects uh, because we can't stop uh, the movement of the fixed wing whenever we cross the roadways. Um, so until we get some regulatory changes on that, uh, you know, right now we'll, we'll probably stick with uh, the multi-rotor so that we can still do that. Great, thank you. And then Christina, um, as you were going through some of your inspection scenarios, we got quite a few questions um, just on pricing in general. So someone asked, what's the average cost of a home inspection? And then another person asked um, about payment terms and then like contracts for repetitive inspections. So if you could kind of just maybe cover um, pricing in, in general, if you don't mind. Sure. Yes. Um, so pricing for the home inspections really varies based on your market. So generally, in, in the in the Midwest market where I'm at, you know, the average home price is two to three hundred thousand, with um, the larger homes being more in the five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollar range. And a home inspection usually costs between maybe four and six or seven hundred dollars. So there isn't a lot of margin to add in a drone pilot there. So those are, while they might be a higher frequency for me, um, they're a lower paying job because sometimes those um, home inspectors are paying basically out of their pocket or out of their own margins in order to cover that flight. Um, so those, yeah, those, those can really vary, but they may be in like the $75 to $150 range. 
Um, and again, it'll vary based on your market. Um, the commercial inspections um, are a little bit different. Um, the, I found that like kind of the construction industry is an amazing industry to be in. Um, there's a little bit more money available there. Unfortunately, construction projects are always over budget, um, which is, I think, common in almost any industry. But um, those ones, they, they do have, they usually have budget available. The important thing is to get in before the construction starts so that program manager does bid your cost in so they're not taking it out of kind of their their own you know budget themselves um so they actually budget for you so we found that we have a higher paying construction you know hourly rate if we can get in before the project begins if it's after the project begins um it's going to be maybe half what we would normally get paid so um the, and the rates are really going to vary based on your area. So I would say, you know, hourly rates between $100 and $250, and that depends on, you know, what kind of equipment you're flying, whether you need visual observers or not, um, and then the products that you're, you're um, develop or sending to the client. Um, and then the other question was, was there another question in there? Um, they asked about payment terms and then contracts for repetitive. Oh, contracts and payment terms. Yes, so um, we take credit card for pretty much everything. It's just the, the way of the industry and then we pay the whatever the processing fee is. Um, so have an online processor and have something that looks um, a little bit professional. Uh, so we always take credit card and then we, our payment terms are, they pay us after the job um, and it's usually a net seven or a seven day payment term. Um, we don't ask for payment before because there are cases, especially for the home inspections, where the drone flight may not happen. So if someone calls for home inspection, they only have maybe 24 hours to get it done. If we can't get out there because of rain, snow, et cetera, um, I don't want to pay the credit card fees and send it back and make negative money. So we actually, we've never had a problem um, with payment from these companies. We have good relationships with them. Um, we've always been paid for them. Um, we do have contracts with our longer term construction companies, those 24 months to 36 months apartment buildings that are going up. Um, and you can work with, you know, a local attorney. There are a lot of small business offices that will actually help you write contracts. So I'd recommend going down that avenue. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Colin, maybe you could cover this one. Someone said, other than Part 107, is there any other education, experience, or background that is required to do inspections like this? Yeah, um, well, you know, definitely, as Christina mentioned, you know, the, the biggest benefit of uh, our workshop and, you know, the um, something that you need to make sure that you understand uh, before you put yourself out there is, you know, knowledge about the industry uh, that you're looking to serve. Um, if you don't understand, you know, the um, the types of things uh, that uh, um, the client is asking you to, to get imagery of, if you don't understand what those things are, you know, where to look for them, you know, what some of the issues may be, uh, that could affect them, you know, from a, an inspection standpoint, you know, that, that we would want to document uh, from a, a damage perspective, things like that, um, then you're not going to be able to, you know, be your most effective. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the, that's probably going to become pretty apparent to the client relatively quickly, and it's going to hurt uh, your overall credibility. Uh, so definitely make sure that you learn about the various industries uh, that you're looking to serve. Um, and also, you know, get some, some time uh, out there flying the aircraft. You know, yes, these aircraft are designed to be tools. Uh, they're designed to be, you know, very easy to operate. Um, however, you know, all of us that uh, that have experience and have gone through the process and, and seen the chaos that the world can throw us, you know, um, we can tell you that, uh, you know, you are going to have an, an increased skill level uh, the more you fly, and that increased skill level is definitely going to translate into better results. Uh, if you go out there with just a Part 107 certificate and, you know, barely a handful of flights under your belt, um, again, you know, the results that you're able to produce and, and what the client's going to think about that, um, you know, chances are it's going to reflect poorly uh, on you. So, you know, take, take the time to make sure you fully understand your system, how to operate it, as well as uh, understand the industries that you're looking to serve. Great. Thank you. And we have um, a couple more minutes left, so we'll cover one more question. And Colin, this one was actually for you as well. Um, you mentioned... Um, you know, how you plan for your, for your different flights. So someone asked, what is your preferred mission planning tool? 
Yeah, so um, from a mission planning standpoint, uh, I, I wouldn't say that I use uh, a, a standard like software package or anything like that. Um, you know, my my mission planning, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, a pre-flight assessment, uh, you know, really starts while I'm at home and it starts uh, by going on the computer and looking at satellite imagery uh, of the areas that we've been assigned to fly, um, trying to figure out, you know, where the hazards are, uh, you know, what uh, are, you know, are the different factors that are going to come into play at that flight uh, and I'll actually start planning out you know what our flight pro profile might look like uh, by looking at that imagery uh, we'll look at places where we have you know alternate landing sites that would be available in case of emergencies uh, you know different things like that um, then you know usually a few days before we start looking at uh, the weather uh, forecasts and uh, you know we that that's really where we get into you know our go no go decision making um, you know once we've obviously confirmed airspace and, and confirm that the job's doable. Um, so weather information, you know, that goes into our planning process and that continues right up to when we actually arrive on site. Um, when we arrive on site, you know, we have to do a, a final assessment. Uh, so we have to see, you know, again, where people are on that day, uh, you know, look around for uh, those areas where, again, we may have issues with birds, um, you know, things like that, uh, different sources of interference. Uh, and, and that, you know, goes into it. Now, if you're talking about flight profile planning from the standpoint of like autonomous software um, you know I like using uh, DJI's ground station pro um, I like using uh, drone deploys uh, command and control software um, I think as, as a third-party developer uh, their command and control software works very well and gives you more options uh, than just your your straight uh, basically terrain modeling uh, with uh, nadir images it also uh, allows for you know better coordination with some of the obliques and, and structural modeling as well at least part of that phase although as I tell everyone you know and we mentioned it before for a lot of a lot of projects that you do with ortho mosaics you know the autonomous software where we'll give you um, a baseline, um, but you are going to need to also be grabbing uh, um, additional data, additional photos while either manually flying or using some other semi-autonomous modes um, because, you know, to fully cover those areas and, and flying at low altitudes where hazards are more prevalent, things like that, um, that definitely becomes an issue. Um, so uh, that's kind of an overview of uh, sort of our, our leading up to the flight uh, process uh, in a nutshell. Awesome, thanks. Um, all right, so that's all the time we have for today. And as you can tell from Christina and Colin's scenarios, our flight instructors really have so much experience in a lot of different industries, and we'd love to share that knowledge. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email us or call us. Um, but besides that, thank you so much, Christina and Colin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Like I mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a, um, an email with a recording of today's webinar, as well as a copy of the slide deck. Um, and thank you again, and we hope to see you guys at an inspections workshop in the future. Thanks, everyone.